I will be discussing um, an ongoing project that I'm working on with a colleague of mine who's based in the United States, and that's why she's not here today, because um, it's five hours earlier for her. And our research is exploring how cultural heritage institutions and digital humanities practitioners can collaborate to open up and share data. So there is the um, fun photo of me uh, with my cat, Possum. I, I like talking about my cats, along with um, my contact information, as well as an image of my colleague, uh, Dr. Vanessa Reyes, and she's based at the University of South Florida. So please do feel free to take screenshots and record any parts of, of my presentation. Um, it's, it's one of those kinds of things that I, I'm not opposed to at all. So um, just as a general kind of note on, on structure and, and organization here, I've integrated a few questions on slides that are kind of formatted this way at the end of, of sections in this presentation so that you can, if, if you're in the working group that I'm going to help facilitate, you'll have questions that, that you can reflect on and consider. And, and then ideally you can connect to your own practice and then share several examples from, from your own work and professional experiences um, so that I can learn from you and I can help facilitate conversations about research data management. So the important part for all of this is what exactly am I interested in discussing? And um, a few years ago, while I was trying to come up with strategies for thinking about why research data management is difficult, I came across an article by Edwards et al. And they presented the concept of data friction, meaning that we all analyze and collect and think about data in different ways. And we all have different institutional and requirements and personal preferences for how we store and organize and share our data, right? And this can become even more obvious and interesting, in my opinion, not necessarily problematic, um, when you're working across disciplines. Now, Edwards and, and his, and his co-authors were thinking about kind of, you know, across kind of disciplines in a very broad sense, you know, like social sciences to physical sciences to humanities. But I like to kind of narrow down and think about kind of the humanities as a very diverse space, right? History is very different than English, which is very different than art history, which is very different than literature. Um, so there's different kinds of data that we're working with, right? And the digital humanities creates a really interesting space to, to bring together conversations about what we mean by data. Right, so I like using the concept of data friction to facilitate these conversations so that we don't have to find one huge way to think about, you know, what is data, but to find common ground so that we can, um, so that we can have conversations. And so this led to the questions that um, I was, you know, developing with my colleague, Vanessa. Um, to use data friction as a framework for exploring how practitioners and researchers manage data within cultural heritage institutions. And then the, the influences, right, the, the policies, the working groups, the professional networks, the conference kinds of proceedings that, and even research, if, if you're feeling particularly ambitious, that researchers and practitioners draw from when they try and have conversations. Right, about data management and good practices for, for data management. Um, so these are the kinds of two questions that, that I've been working with for the past few years. I still don't have any answers, um, but I have developed strategies for, for engaging in conversations, which brings us to our next um, slide with questions. Right. Um, I find data friction to be a very helpful concept, but I also realize that it might not actually be that helpful for everyone, right? So just kind of with initial impressions, is it a helpful kind of concept to use, right? To, to kind of frame why research data management is a process and why that process is sometimes messy and why it sometimes doesn't go as we think it should. Um, and then the kind of follow-up question to that, and this is very much based in opinions and experiences, right? Um, right, is, research data management actually interdisciplinary? I think it is, but that doesn't actually <laughs> signify anything. I've, I've realized that as an academic, right, my, my perspectives aren't actually always in touch with reality and the job that, that I kind of 
think of my research having to meet is saying, well, are my assumptions accurate? Who should I talk to to test them, right? So this brings me to the why do I actually have an opinion that's worth sharing? Um, why has Ersuvet like actually um, invited me to participate in this fantastic workshop? Um, in 2018, and that should say 2020, not 2002, um, pardon, pardon the typo there, um, I, Vanessa and I started um, circulating surveys and conducting interviews via email, so correspondence, um, to engage in conversations with practitioners across Europe and um, in parts of the United States. We didn't have very many participants, but you know, um, from those conversations and from our survey data, we were able to start identifying areas for further exploration. Right. And so our key findings is that, you know, as we had assumed, the digital humanities is an incredibly diverse space, right? And this means that it's very difficult to define what data is within the digital humanities. And everybody has an opinion. And so the trick is to find a context for discussing and using those opinions in a way that doesn't just make you want to quit and, you know, go off on, on a long holiday on a sunny beach somewhere. And so the, the kind of goal that, that we want to explore for research data management positions and tasks and, and kinds of collaborative practices is to think about what types of what types of practices are useful, what types of stakeholders and users are, are kind of essential and need to be engaged in research data management, right? And then when we discuss, you know, sustainability, we need to actually think about institutional needs and then also the kinds of infrastructures and networks that can be kind of tapped into and used to help actually kind of appropriately consider right, research data management within kinds of the context of cultural heritage institutions and the ways that they can facilitate digital humanities research. So our kind of recommendations that, that came out of this, this ongoing research project um, is that adapting terminology is essential, right? As, you know, a research data management expert and practitioner, um, there's some really fancy terms that we can use and really specific terms that we often need to use when we work with IT, when we work with digital preservation experts and infrastructure kinds of networks. Um, but those aren't always relevant to researchers or even kinds of, you know, other practitioners outside of the research data management kind of context. And so finding a way to adapt terminology so that it can be used widely and discussed kind of clearly is essential, right? And to do this, some of the, the really useful suggestions that we received from participants was to use defining the, the kind of process of defining and clarifying terminology as a way to identify stakeholders and users that can become involved in research data management so that it's not just done in isolation. Right, so the goal is to share knowledge, right, through information management, right, that, that, that was kind of the overarching kind of optimistic kind of outcome that, that we identified that all of the, the, the 18 um, participants that we had in total were able to kind of say, this is what we're working towards, these are the steps that we're taking, right. Um, so, to kind of wrap up here. Um, and to kind of think in more detail and what I would like to discuss in, in breakout sessions kind of today and later in the week is whether or not data friction actually is a useful topic um, and concept to kind of facilitate conversations amongst practitioners at kind of across different institutions and then even kind of optimistically with users and kinds of stakeholders um, that, that you know, require research data management services. Um, and then to kind of, you know, fit in with the broader research context that, that I work in, right? Um, what are the key RDM tasks researchers should use to share their data, right? Because a lot of the time researchers have particular kinds of practices that you know, research data management experts have to adapt to, but you know, it should kind of go both ways. So knowing what researchers do, how can we use that knowledge to kind of improve research data management policies? And then kind of very selfishly, I would like to hear more about kind of 
drop participants kinds of strategies and activities um, and, and kinds of networks for managing data at, at your kind of in your current roles. Um, and then to kind of also compile a wish list of like, who would we ideally have involved in research data management practices to kind of make life easier and more kind of manageable. So yeah, so that is the end of my of my presentation. Um, hopefully it was um, useful. Now let's see, I can I can stop sharing my screen so that um, we can move on to the next wonderful and amazing um, presentation.